Hi guys, today we're going to start talking about ecology. So I need you to get out your ecology notes packet and turn to page 5. We're going to take notes on page 5, 6, and 7 today. We're going to start out talking about ecology, just kind of the overview, the basis of what it is, and then we're going to move into some more in-depth stuff. So before we talk about ecology, we need to know what is ecology. And if we break down the word, eco means environment and ology means the study of. So environment plus the study of equals the study of the environment. Okay, we're going to take those, um, the stuff that we learn about the environment, we're going to study those patterns and we're going to try to explain them. So whenever we do this, we're going to start out with an organism. Okay, that's what's at the very tip top of this pyramid. And an organism is one single thing. Then we're going to move into a population, and a population is lots of that one single thing. So you are an organism, your class is a population. Then we jump off into community, and a community is lots of different populations hanging out together. And an ecosystem is when we take all those populations, that whole community, and we add in stuff that's not living to it. So, whenever we talk about stuff that's not living, we're actually talking about an abiotic factor. If we break down this word, a means not or without, and bio means life. So, these are non-living factors that are going to affect living factors. And a living factor is called a biotic factor. Bio means life. So, these are living things that affect other living things, like the trees outside affect us, because if they don't put out enough oxygen, well, we can't breathe and we all die. So I want you to take just a minute and decide, do you think that these things here are biotic or abiotic? That's okay, I'll wait. Okay, so if we take a look at these lists, you should have decided that soil pH, light intensity, annual precip, pollution, and CO2 levels are all abiotic factors while predators, infections, and plants are biotic because these are living things that are going to affect other living things. Here's some more vocab. We've got the biosphere, and the biosphere is the part of the earth and its atmosphere that can support life. So we're talking about the highest point in the atmosphere where things can live and the deepest parts of the ocean where things can live. Now, we're not talking about the entire Earth because if we go to the very center of the Earth, nothing can live there because it's too hot and there's too much pressure. Then we have an ecosystem. This is the relationship between organisms, abiotic factors, and the habitat. So this is basically everything that's in an environment. Then we have community. This is a collection of populations that share the same resources, and there's lots of different species involved here. So a community might be all the living things that we can find if we went out on the nature trail, okay? We would find different types of plants, different bugs, different um, animals, and you, you know, you would be part of that community. And finally, we have a population. Population are the same species competing for the same resources and interbreeding. Um, we've talked about habitat, and a habitat is basically just your address. It's where you live. So a frog's habitat might be a pond. Your habitat might be Climax or Liberty or Franklinville, um, Pleasant Garden. I probably left something out. Staley, if I did, let me know. Um, a niche is its job or its way of life. So your job right now is to be a good kid, obey your parents, listen to me, and learn a little bit of biology, right? My job is to teach you. The tree's job is to give me oxygen, okay? So if we take a look at a polar bear, for example, a polar bear's habitat includes Alaska, Greenland, um, Canada, basically anywhere that's going to have some packed snow. There's got to be an average temperature of below zero, and we're going to find seals, eggs, and vegetation around because that's what the polar bear eats. The polar bear's niche is that it's a predator. Its job is to eat other organisms because if it wasn't there to eat them, then they would overpopulate. They breed April through June, and most of the time they're solitary unless it's a mom with her cubs, it's mating season, or there are abundant food sources around, or it's December and we're watching a Coke commercial. 
So if we go back to the original idea, any change at one level is going to affect all the other levels. We call this a ripple effect. So with that polar bear, if all the polar bears were to die out, then the seal population would go up. Well, then if the seal population goes up, what's going to happen to all the organisms that the seals eat? Well, their population is going to go down. So I want you to think about this because we're going to talk about it in class um, in a couple of days. Why do you think it is that the number of people with Lyme disease, remember we get Lyme disease from ticks, directly correlates or goes along with the annual rainfall for the previous year? What do you think rain has to do with Lyme disease? Now, let's move on and let's talk about population studies. Later this week, we're going to talk about communities and ecosystems. So basically, I'm taking all that stuff that was in that triangle that we talked about, or that pyramid, and we're going to break it down and I'm going to go more in depth. So, population studies. Um, a remember, a population is the same species in the same area, using the same resources, and interbreeding. Now, we study these so that um, we can figure out different things about the population. We study the population's density, its distribution, and its size. And remember, all of these things are related to the biotic and abiotic factors in that environment. The population size is the number of organisms in the population. So depending on which class of mine you're in, there is a population of 20, um, 34, or 31 humans in our classroom at any given time, assuming that there's no one extra in here and nobody is absent. The population density is how crowded it is. You may have noticed this year that the population in your classrooms is getting a lot more crowded. And the population distribution is the spatial arrangement of the members. So you might be set up in rows in some classes. In my class you're set up in groups of three. So you could be spread out or you could be clumped together. So again, population density is how crowded a population is. So if we take a look at this map here, we see that the darker areas on the map have a lot more people. And you'll notice that a lot of those dark areas are around where there's water. Why do you think that might be? You've probably talked about that in your world history class at some point. Now, if you take a look here, we've got a lot of people living here. This is New York City here, so we know that there's a lot of people that live around New York City and commute. Down here, we've got um, the Florida Peninsula, we've got the Panhandle. Now, we've got a lot of really light places here. Why do you think there's not going to be a lot of people living in these areas? What do you think their environment is like? What do you think they have to offer, that area has to offer? Well, most of the people here are going to be some sort of rancher or um, you know, there's not really a whole lot of job opportunities there, so there's no reason for there to be a lot of people. Here we see some population distribution. We see these plants right here. They're like students in rows, okay? So they're all in a row together. And the reason that farmers plant like this is so that it's easier for them to get to each individual plant and take care of them. Here we see some flowers that are a little bit clumped together in groups. Okay, kind of like you might be in some of your classes. Some of your math classes I know set up like this. My class is set up like this. Okay, the reason that I do it is because it's a lot easier for me to talk to 11 groups than it is for me to talk to 33 students. Here we see a population that is super clumped together and the reason why is because there's food there. Now, if we talk about the um, population size, if the birth rate is higher than the death rate, what's going to happen to the population size? If the death rate is higher than the birth rate, then what's going to happen to the population size? Now, whenever we talk about the population growth rate, we're going to talk about the change in a population size over time. And it's going to be a sloped line. Okay, so here we see that the population is going up, 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 up. This is right now what the human population looks like. We keep going up super fast. Here we see a population that goes up for a while and then it looks like it starts to level off and we call this carrying capacity. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. So we've got two different models. We've got growth model one which shows exponential growth. Remember an exponential curve looks like a J. Okay, So we can call it a J-shaped curve. It has ideal environmental conditions, there's a maximum growth rate, and the larger the population gets, the faster the rate increases. 
think about it this way. If there are a lot of humans on Earth, well, there's a lot of humans that can populate the Earth, so they're going to keep having babies, and more and more babies are going to be born each year. Now, there are some limits to growth. Sometimes um, things happen that make it so that a population can't grow exponentially forever. What do you think those things are? I want you to take just a minute and write them on the edge of your paper. Now, if you take a look here, this is the human population growth. This is what's happened to the human population over the years. And if you look, the only time that we've really had a significant decrease is when the plague occurred. And when the plague occurred, well, there were a lot of people that were all living clumped up together. The people who were most affected by the plague were the people who lived in the cities. Okay? There were a lot of people that if they had the funds, if they had the resources, they sent their children off to a farm, to an aunt or an uncle, someone who lived on a farm, so that that way their kids wouldn't be affected. Um, so we know that there are some factors that are going to limit our growth whenever we're in a close proximity to each other. Now, this could be because resources are limited, or what we call a limiting factor. Um, this is when a resource is in the shortest supply. It determines how many organisms the environment can support. These could be things like food, clean water, disease, hurricanes. Okay, um, If there is a disease like the plague, if people are spread out, then they're not going to get hurt as much or they're not going to get um, sick as much. But if people are all on top of each other, then yeah, they're all going to get sick. Um, if there's not a lot of food, well, we can't have a whole lot of um, organisms because there's nothing for them to eat. Now, I told you we were going to talk about carrying capacity, and carrying capacity isn't just the number of babies that mama can carry on her back because, well, we all know that mama carries babies on her back. Um, this is the population size that the environment can support for a long period of time without damaging the environment. It's determined by some sort of limiting factor and it can be seasonal. Sometimes we see populations increase in the summer but decrease in the winter. So this is population model two. It's an S-shaped curve. If you look, here's like the tip of the S and it kind of goes like this. You kind of have to tilt your head sideways. But you see that there's something right here that Kevin Park in Doug Green. Kevin Park in Doug Green, if you're in the building, and even if you're outside on the football field, come on in. I need to see you for a minute. Please report to uh, Ms. Ford's old office. Thank you. Okay, so just so you know, Dr. Goble is now in Ms. Ford's old office, and he needs to see Ms. Park and Mr. Park and Mr. Green. So the logis this, we call this a logistic model. Um, populations are going to increase in size, but then some sort of limiting factor is going to put a pressure on that population so that the growth slows and it levels off, and we call this the carrying capacity. Now, there, um, whenever we talk about predators and prey, if we look at this um, graph, which for whatever reason is a graph that North Carolina loves to put on your EOC, so make sure that you understand this. The red here is the predator and the black is the prey. So we see as the predator population goes up, the prey population is going to start to go down. Well, as the prey population goes down, the predators don't have much to eat, so they start to die off. Well, whenever they start to die off, the prey is able to reproduce more. Okay, and then it just keeps going back and forth. So whenever we see a graph like this, this is called a predator-prey graph, and usually the predators are going to just barely follow behind the prey. So that's it for what we need.